Amen. Well, we've been looking at uh, this new church in Thessalonica that got started many, many years ago in the ancient region of Macedonia, or northern Greece. It is a city anywhere of 100 to 200,000 people. Today, a city called Thessaloniki. And so if you brought your Bibles, uh, you can grab one there close by. It'll also be on the screen, but I know you're going to want to follow along because we're going to look at several scriptures this morning in this passage. So this is a church, as we've already learned, that, that got started by the Apostle Paul and his missionary team, uh, missionaries who were there for only a short time. If you remember, they were there, it says in Acts chapter 17, they were there for three Sabbaths, and Paul reasoned with them in the synagogue, and so he was probably there longer than that, but uh, it was a short time. And then they experienced persecution, had to flee, and so Paul has been away from these people that he loves. And so what we're going to look at today is, is a larger portion of Scripture in 1 Thessalonica chapter 2 and moving into chapter 3. And we're going to see where the Apostle Paul tells us how we actually get the letter today. And so he will send his young associate, Timothy, to go back into uh, Thessalonia, Thessal Thessalonica, and then he's going to get some news back. And so he writes this letter in response to that. So I want us to read the full portion of Scripture. It's 17 verses long, so that it gives us the bigger picture of what is happening here. And then we'll see in this, and I want us to see this because I think as we read the full passage, we're going to see the missionary team's heart, and specifically we're going to see Paul's heart for these people. But before we read it, let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. What is it that makes Paul, this great apostle, so influential, and not just in his day, but in such a way that it would impact the world for centuries to come? What, what, would, what is it about Paul's life that, he, that made him so impactful, not just in his day, but in the world in, in, for centuries to come? And in answering that question... What relevance would that have for me? If Paul changed his world, could there be some things that I could learn, perhaps, that God might use in my life to change the world around me? Now, we know that Paul is a church planter. He is author of much of the New Testament. He's a man whose writings have influenced the world for centuries. His impact has forever changed the world. Even now, here we are sitting in a village that bears his name, St. Paul Devance, called Devance, because there are nine other villages in, in the country of France also named St. Paul. This incredible impact that Paul has made. What, what is it that made him so impactful? I want to read a portion of, uh, from a book that N.T. Wright wrote about the Apostle Paul, his biography. Listen to these words that he writes. Human culture has normally developed at the speed of a glacier. We moderns, accustomed to sudden changes and dramatic revolutions, need to remind ourselves that things have not usually worked this way. Slow and steady is, has been the rule. He goes on to say that occasional uh, inventions that suddenly transform human life for good or ill, the wheel, the printing press, gunpowder, the internet, those are rare. That is why the events, and he's referring here to the Apostle Paul's ministry changing the world, that is why the events that unfolded 2,000 years ago in southeastern Europe and western Asia are as startling in retrospect as they, as they are in our time. And then listen to these words that he says. Paul might dispute the suggestion that he himself changed the world. Jesus, he would have said, had already done that. But what Paul said about Jesus and about God, about the world, and what it means to be genuinely human was creative and compelling and controversial in his own day and even after. And then he closes here. He goes on to say, but he says, nothing would be quite the same again. The Apostle Paul, his incredible impact. Now, think with me for, for just a minute. 
we, most of us here, we would know enough about the Apostle Paul that we would think, okay, here's, here are some obvious reasons I think we could go to as to why he had such an impact in his world that continues to extend to our day. For example, his intense Jewish education. He grew up in such a way that, that he would have known the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, frontwards and backwards. He knew them deeply. They were part and woven into his life. We would also probably say, okay, Paul had this dramatic conversion, right? On the road to Damascus, there's this literal blinding light that comes upon him, and he is forever changed because of that. It completely redirected his life as a Jew, as a Pharisee, somebody who was pursuing a completely different way of life. Now it's completely different, and he's promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ instead of trying to, to squelch that. We would also probably go back to his calling as an apostle, in Romans chapter 1, it says that he's called to be an apostle. Apostle, He's set apart for the gospel. I mean, God has specifically appointed Paul for this task. That would be a certain reason why he is so influential. We could go back to his clear call to get into the territory of Europe. If you remember, he was sort of stuck trying to figure out, God, where are you taking me? And the Spirit of Jesus was preventing him. But then... He gets this Macedonian vision, and God calls him specifically to uh, the places now that he is going. That's why he had such a great impact. It was God's clear call on his life. And then I would go to his gifting of reasoning the Scriptures in the synagogue. He was brilliant. He was able to take the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures that he knew so well, and then to unfold them and reason with people and, and bring the gospel out of that. A great ability. I would also go to his commitment to the gospel. We saw this in chapter 1. I came to you with the gospel, in power, with the Holy Spirit, with full conviction. Why was he so impactful? Because he carried the greatest message of mankind, the gospel of Jesus Christ that liberates, that gives freedom. And then I would also certainly go to his integrity. To live as Christ and to die as gain. Jesus was his life. Uh, the way he lived his life, was he was completely sold out to Jesus Christ. All of those would be reasons that we would give as to how this man made such an impact in his day that extends to our day. Now, as we read this next section of Scripture in Thessalonians, I want us to see more than that. To me, those are the obvious things. And, and to be clear as we read this, I want us to make sure we understand this is really not about Paul. It's about how God is using Paul to change his world. This is, uh, this is his call, God's chosen vessel, and he's using Paul to do something, something significant. Just like God uses us. It's God's work in us and through us. So this is way more than about Paul, but Paul is the one that God is using, and so we're going to see some character qualities in his life. So as God's chosen vessel for God to use you to change your world as a dad, as a mom, as a friend, as a teacher, someone practicing medicine or through your business, how does God do that? That's what I want us to pick up on in this passage, okay? So we're going to read all 17 verses. It's a little bit lengthy. Don't, don't uh, check out, but follow along. Stay with me, and uh, let's take a look at what made Paul such a great impact uh, in, in his day and ours too. All right, verse 17 of chapter 2. Let's read this together. I'll read it out loud, and you follow along. But since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we, we kept telling you beforehand that we would, were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. 
For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to you, to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. I want to lift out from this passage three qualities in the life of Paul that God used to change his world and how God can do the same in your world through your life. Here, here, let me just give you the the overview, and then we'll come back and look at these three. But I want us to notice, first of all, Paul's deep affection for these people. I mean, you could see that very clearly, his deep affection for these people. Then secondly, I want you to see Paul's understanding of the opposition that faced him. There was clear opposition here, and he, he had to understand that and be able to work through that. And we want to look at that for a moment. And then finally, Paul's ultimate motivation and why he's even doing what he's doing, because that's in this passage as well. So his affection for these people, the opposition that he faces and has to work through that, and then the motivation why he's doing what he's doing. And all three of those things, I think, relate to us as well in our, in our circumstances. So first of all, Paul's deep affection for the people that he's writing to. Now, we often see Paul the apostle, Paul the missionary, Paul the preacher, the writer, the philosopher, the theologian. But here here we see something really different in Paul's life. We see Paul the person. We get a glimpse of his humanity, his heart. For example, look at some of the words that Paul will use as he writes to these Thessalonians. Before, last week, for example, in chapter 2, we didn't read this this morning, but last week we saw that Paul was like a child to these people that he went and ministered to. What does he mean? He was gentle among them. And then he also used, uh, said, I was like a mother to you. I was nurturing to you. And then he also says he was like a father to them in the way that he encouraged them. And now in verse 17, he uses the word brothers, which is brothers and sisters. It's all the, it's mankind, but brothers. It's a familiar term. In fact, Paul uses the word brothers 130 times in his writings. It's not about friendship for Paul. It's about kinship for Paul. We see his heart, his love, his passion for these people. And as we continue here in verse 17, it says, We were torn away from you. That word torn away in the Greek is the word that we get for orphan. We were orphaned, Paul says. We were like separated from you. We were, we were lost without you. We were worried about you. He's using this, this intense word of being separated because of his love for them as family. And then again in verse 17, as we move on, we were separated in person, but not in heart. This word heart is cardia. It's it's not the organ that pumps your blood. It's the seat of your emotions. Paul is saying, my heart has always been with you. Verse 17, we continue to see a language of extremes that conveys his longing heart to see them. We endeavored more eagerly with great desire. One commentary writer said, the language is unequivocal. It was not lack for not for lack of serious, heartfelt effort that Paul and Silas did not return to Thessalonica. In other words, Paul is communicating something here. It's extreme language. It's a deep, affectionate love for these people that he's conveying. 
We go on in chapter 3 in verses 1 and, and 5. He says two times that his burden was so great that he could bear it no longer. We see that phrase twice. He could bear it no longer. And so being prevented from going back himself, what did he do? He sends Timothy to go back and to check on them. And then in verse 6, he says, we long to see you. In verse 8, he's, he ties his own well-being to their well-being. He says, now we live since we know that you live. Since we know that you're doing okay, now we can live and, and, and be uh, joyful. And then in verse 10, he says, we pray most earnestly for you that we could see you face to face. And in verse 12, he communicates his love for them again, the Greek word here being agape. Now, why, why is all of this even important? Why is it important that we think about Paul's affection for these people? Because Paul wants them to know that he's not some fly-by-night evangelist who comes in to preach the gospel for three weeks or for a few months and then leaves without con concern of them, for them. He wants to communicate his love for them. In other words, the gospel is not just about the gospel. It's a gospel to people. It's a gospel that he cares about and that he loves. And I think that's hugely important as we, as we, as God uses us in our world, that we have Paul's heart for the people that we're seeking to reach. So priority one, if you want to bring change as a parent, as a teacher, a neighbor, a friend at work, people have got to see your heart. They've got to see that you deeply care about them, and they've got to hear about that. They've got to know that. They've got to sense your love for them. And I fear that we live in a day where it's like, let's get the gospel out. Let's make sure we preach the gospel. But people don't necessarily feel the love that comes with that. I remember watching a TV episode years ago that was highlighting this proud bomber as he was flying his, you know, his B-2 bomber over uh, uh, villages and places in the Korean War and, and, you know, sort of bragging about his job. And then he was visiting a, a mass unit one day and he, all of a sudden he saw the faces of the people in the mass unit and they had names. And they were real people. And they had families. And it just completely wrecked him because he realized all of a sudden, wait a second, these are people. And this is, this is what ministry has to be. It's not about a campaign for Paul of starting churches, writing letters, preaching the gospel. What makes him so effective? Yes, it's that. But it's a deep affection for these people, like his whole livelihood, his whole well-being was tied to these people, his deep affection for them. So here's the question, just as we get started. Do, you, do the people that you live with, that you go to church with, that you work with, the people that you lead, do they know of your affection for them? Do they sense that? I don't know that you know, I really agree with him on everything, but I know that he cares for me as a person. Wow, what a great testimony that that would be. That is a good beginning place for us. Paul's affection. Changing the world by a sincere, deep affection for other people. Here's the second thing I think that we see in Paul's life, and that is his understanding of opposition and how he handles that opposition. So, he wants to get there. He can't get there. In verse 18, it says, We wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but what? But Satan hindered us. So Paul is making sure that he, he, wanted, he, he wants them to know, I tried. I tried to get there. I did everything that I could to visit you. But there was opposition, and Satan prevented me from getting there. Now, we don't know exactly what this opposition would have been. It could have been a possible legal prohibition from coming back into the city. Remember, he was run out. He, he left Thessalonica for his very life. He was chased out of town. So maybe there was some kind of legal prohibition for him coming back into Thessalonica. Maybe it was a personal health issue for Paul or even some kind of unexplainable spiritual warfare. But whatever the case, Paul understands that there is opposition 
and he's working through it. And so in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 3, he talks about, he knows about opposition. He, he reminds them about the afflictions that they were going through. And that he said, I, I warned you that you would be going through this persecution yourself. He also talks about, he mentions the tempter. I was afraid that the tempter would try to get you off course. Paul is very aware that there's opposition to what he is trying to accomplish. And he knows the source of that opposition, that it's not flesh and blood. We read it elsewhere, but it's spiritual in nature. It's the, in this, this word Satan is the Hebrew word. It's Satan in Hebrew. In, in the Greek, it's the devil or adversary. And he's very aware what this enemy is trying to, to accomplish. And so what does he do? How does he face this opposition? He pushes through it. He, he figures out a way to, to move through it by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God. Here are some things that he does. Number one, he sends Timothy to go back and check on them, to encourage them, to build them up, to let them know of Paul's love for them. In other words, he can do something. I can't go, but I can do something. I can send Timothy. Here's the second thing that he does. He prays for them. Prayer is all throughout this letter so far in chapters 1 and 2, and, and again here in, in chapter 3, in verse 10, it says, I prayed earnestly night and day. He continued to pray that he could go see them. In verse 12, it says that uh, a prayer that their love for others would grow. So what he's doing is he's sending Timothy. I can do that. I can pray for you. Nothing is preventing me from praying for you, and there's power in that. And then finally, what does he do? He writes them a letter that we're reading today. He sends them this letter to encourage them. So mark this down, that when you want to make an impact and you're saying, God, would you use me to change my world for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ, for whatever you're calling me to be a part of, whatever you're telling me to do, mark it down. Satan will hinder you. Opposition will come. Trials will come your way. It is the world that we live in. But... When faced with opposition, and it seems like Satan is having his way, that God is sovereign over that opposition, and that he is working through the opposition to accomplish his purposes because his purposes cannot be thwarted. Paul's plans were thwarted. God's purposes were not thwarted. God has the final word. God is working His purposes, not despite, but through the opposition. That is so critical for us to understand. That when I feel the opposition, that God is working through that to accomplish His, His purposes. And how, how did that work for Paul? Paul was able to see that these people could grow without him being there. Paul felt this need as a spiritual father to get back, but what he learned when Timothy came back is they're actually growing, and they're doing well. And Paul still wanted to get there, and he wanted to teach them, which he would do many years later, but God was at work in their lives anyway. And then this opposition encouraged Timothy, who is probably now in his early 20s, in his own personal growth as God's co-worker. And so here we see that, that God is using now Timothy, whereas Timothy probably could have sat on the sideline, but God is doing something significant in Timothy's life as well. And then the opposition brought these people a letter, and they were able to hear his heart. And listen, 2,000 years later, we're reading the letter, and God is using this in our lives. And is encouraging us through it as God's inspired word to help us. So opposition, but doesn't thwart God's purposes. And God is using it even today in our lives. So Satan's opposition here only moved the cause of the gospel further as he pushed through. So the, the big question is, is what is your opposition? What is your opposition today? What can you do? Well, you can pray, and, and it's not like, well, I guess I'll just, I can just pray. No. 
Prayer is powerful. God can sometimes do more through your prayer than he can do in your being there. And so pray, pray, pray. That's what Paul does. What else can you do? Well, God can give you alternate routes to do something. He sends Timothy in this case. And, and as we submit to God and just say, okay, God, this is the situation. I'm being hindered in this, but how do you want to work around it? What do you want to do through it? And begin to ask God, what are the alternatives that you can do as you wait on the Lord? Your opposition is not a closed door for, for impact. It's an opportunity for impact in a different way. Okay, where are we? His affection, his deep affection for these people, they felt that. They were changed by it. The opposition... He worked through it, and the people were able to see that. Now, here's the last thing that we see, and, is, and we see Paul's ultimate motivation here. And I want you to notice in two different places in our text. In chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it says, What is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. And then in chapter 3, verse 13, that He may establish your hearts blameless, that God might establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of His saints. What is Paul's motivation? It's about really the theme of the letter of Thessalonians. He, he knows the end game. He knows that Jesus Christ is coming back. He's been sent on mission. I want these people to be ready. Jesus is coming. I want them to be prepared for eternity. And he keeps the end game in mind. That's his motivation. I'm working for that purpose. And so he just keeps serving and he keeps working because these people are the joy that he wants to present as a crown to the Father. That's his motivation. So in the end, this is really not about Paul or even Paul's influence. It's about Paul being driven to do everything possible to get them ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's our call too. As parents, as, church, as a church, to be ready. He's coming. To be holy and blameless at His coming. To be ready and prepared for that to be driven. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about uh, the Denver Nuggets, that they were on this quest to, re to, uh, to win a national championship. And we saw that that happened where uh, Nikola Jokic led the way, the Serbian. And, uh, and just this drive to win a, an NBA championship, first one ever for them in the history of, of that basketball team. And then last Sunday night, uh, Totally shouldn't have done it, but I got just hooked and tied in. I was watching a golf tournament. Uh, it was the Canadian Open, and because of the time difference, I was up till 2 a.m. trying to figure out who's going to win this golf tournament. And I saw Nick Taylor, who went into four extra holes, and he was just, he was the Canadian. And it had been years, I can't remember how many years, but like 50, 60 years since a Canadian had actually won the golf tournament and he was driven and he actually wins this golf tournament with a 72 foot putt and the crowd goes wild in Canada and he's driven and I think about okay we see a drivenness in sports what are you driven for what what drives you what drove the Apostle Paul what drove him he was driven to help people be ready for the coming of Christ. What if this could be our drive? I'm driven to do what uh, Paul did. So, to close, let me ask you this question. How can you, where you are, impact your world? And as we close, just think about this. Well, I can look to Paul. I can see his affection for people. I need more affection for people. I can... Look to Paul, and I can see the opposition and re recognize, okay, I'm always going to have opposition. I've got to work through that. I can see Paul's motivation. Okay, that's great. I need to be more motivated and more driven. And we can walk away, and we can say, okay, I'm going to do better. But I think there's an alternate plan. Because I think Paul knew something about the one he was promoting. I think Paul knew 
how the gospel changed his life and how Jesus Christ of the gospel changed his life. And so what changed Paul has to change us. It cannot be just an example from Paul that we do better. But what do we see in the life of Christ? We see in the life of Christ His affection for you and for me. The Bible says when Jesus saw the crowds, He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This affection, this compassion. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus, His affection for you, that's what motivates me. That's what motivates you. His affection for me. It, it, I receive that for what He did for me. And then think about how do I influence? Well, because of we see the opposition in Christ and how He pushed through His opposition. Satan trying to keep Him from fulfilling God's purposes of redemption. And even with Peter, he looked at Peter and said, get behind me, because it wasn't Peter, it was Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're blocking my way. You're not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. And he pushes through the opposition in the garden. He says, not my will, God, but your will be done. And so Jesus pushes through the opposition. Why? What was his motivation? His affection for you, his opposition to push through, but what was his motivation? We see his motivation in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus, who for the joy that was before him, endured the cross. And what was that joy? It was the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption for you, so that we would be sitting here today talking about the things that we're talking about. His motivation was for you and for me to fulfill God's plan. In John 14, I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said. I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. What's his motivation? It's to get us home. He, he, he was motivated. This is how we change our world. This is how we impact people around us. A deep affection for people. A genuine love for others. Why do I do what I do in the church? Why do I teach? Why do I give? Why do I serve? What, what is this all about? It's not about the job. It's not about the project. It's about a deep love for the people. That's what this is about. And you're going to face opposition. There are going to be things that happen that you don't like, that come against you, that frustrate you. It's part of the deal. And we work through that opposition. Why? Because of the motivation that we are family and God is getting us home and we want to be prepared for that. So as we close our time here, is this your life? Is this our life? Is this the life of St. Paul, IBC? May it be so. May God work in our lives in this way. Let's pray. Our God and Father, what an amazing, amazing God that you are. That you would pursue us the way that you have. That, Father, you would come in flesh and live among us and die for us because of your love for mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Father, we thank you that you pushed through opposition, that God, you, that Christ, as you walked in this earth, you did not submit to the ways of this world. You did not bow the knee to another. But Lord, you, you surrendered only to the will of your Father. We thank you for that. And Father, we thank you that you came, you are motivated because you love us and you want us with you. You want us with you in this new heaven and new earth that you call us to. And my prayer is today that, Lord, if there is a single person here in this room who has not received this gift of salvation, they've not seen your affection, that you went to the cross for them, that you love them, that you're calling them to yourself, that this would be their day of salvation as they call to you for salvation. Thank you for grace that we be a church that God impacts our world by the way that we love others and the way that we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.